like I talked about living from the fire, but this is, um, I'm not even really sure what to say about this. I guess you could say living from the fire part two, but this is something very important. I guess you could say it's more in depth of how to live from the fire. Okay. Because the thing is, and I want everybody to understand this, there has been a lot of stuff that has been going on in the world. There has been a lot of stuff that um, preachers and a lot of things that have just been said and done and, and, and a lot of things. And let me just tell you, I believe that one of the things that um, one of my spiritual fathers, um, Kevin Zadai said, I believe is absolutely true that God is now seeing who's on fire for him, who is not. That's really where we're at right now. It's like, who's on fire, who is not? Who is truly for him and for his ways and who is just looking for him just to grant favor or kindness? Like, basically, you're treating God like... um. Um, how do I put this? Just like, um, you know, well, God is good all the time and all the time God is good, but you don't even fully understand that sometimes God will do things that does not look good, but it's for your good. You understand this here. And the thing is, when people get offended with God or get upset with God, a lot of times it's because that they don't like or that they don't accept that he's the one who is always right. They think that they are partly right. But let me tell you something. There is nothing that will humble you more than when that holy fire starts to ignite you and touch you. Because when you are on fire for God and that fire begins to consume you, the fire is also how you learn the ways of God. I'm going to get to the scripture in a minute, but I want you to understand that. The fire is what helps you understand the ways of God because that fire is what um, gets rid of that sinful nature. It starts to cause the sinful nature to die. It starts to, like, in the same way that f fire... Um, begins to destroy and, and remove certain things in the same way that's what it does. But fire also has a way of purifying. Did you know that gold cannot, um, its purest form is purified in fire? So if you want your heart to be gold, in fact, this is even what Christ said. Christ said, buy of me gold tried by the fire. But some of you have no idea what that even means. And that's the part that I want to get to is that the fire, most people, you start talking about fire, people's like, no, we don't want the holy fire. Why? Because the holy fire is going to remove some of the things that you are attached to and like the most. The holy fire will make you give up your ways for God's way. The fire will make you give up. I'm right. For his righteousness. The fire is what makes you more and more like King Yeshua because Yeshua is in the fire. In fact, that's what the Lord told me. The Lord told me, like Simba, you have to learn the holy fire because even when you say, I am in you, you are in me, we are one, you have to realize where I am when you say that. And you have to realize what you're asking to come to you when you ask that. I said, Lord, what do you mean? He said, because when you are saying, I am in you, you are in me, we are one, we are never separated, you are saying you want to come into the realm of fire of where I dwell with my father. You're saying you want to come on the sapphire floor that you read about in Exodus 24. You're saying you want all of your darkness to be exposed and removed and you want to do things my way and my father's way. That's what you're saying. 
And if you ask, you will receive it. But you need to understand what it is that you're asking for because the results are going to look very different than how you expect. What do you mean it's going to look different? Like sometimes being in that fire, the enemy starts to ramp up spiritual warfare against you because he doesn't want you to touch the holy fire. Why? Because he can't touch it anymore. It, it now burns against him. And I'll show you that in the scripture. It now comes against him and it destroys him. And it destroys his work. In fact, the Lord said, you know, when the scripture where it says, and I went around destroying the works of the devil. And I said, yes. He says, Simba, I was using the holy fire to destroy the works of the devil. I said, really? He said, yes. He said, remember when I said in the scriptures, I came to set a fire. Oh, I hope you guys are catching this. He said, I came to set a fire and I, and he said, and how I wish you were already burned up or you were already on fire. I said, oh my goodness. I could not believe that. I missed that all the time. I read that scripture. I didn't put two and two together. He was using the holy fire to destroy the works of the devil. That's why in Hebrews, it calls his ministers flames of fire. This is what you are supposed to do. Why do you think he was telling his disciples, heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out devils? He was telling them that. He was telling them that not just to invoke the kingdom, but to use the fire of God to destroy. Because you have to get rid of the enemy in certain aspects. And then you need to replace him with something else. Whatever you remove or destroy in the spirit realm, it has to be replaced. It is not enough for you to pray for people who have depression, anxiety, suicidal thoughts, and who are in Gnosticism and who are experiencing sleep paralysis. It is not enough for you just to bind the devil and make him flee. It is not enough for you to cast them out and send them into dry places. You must now fill that person with the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, that spirit that you just got rid of is going to come back. Why do you think so many times, and I refuse to do this now, there are some people who they keep calling me and they ask me to pray for them um, and to release the Holy Spirit, and then they feel better and and the demon leaves and and the and the spiritual oppression is off of them but then they don't fill themselves with the power that i just release they don't fill themselves up so that that spirit doesn't come back this is what i see see i got some people in the church you know you Praising God and you worshiping, but are you really getting filled with the fire of God? Is your congregation literally being filled with the fire of God? Are their lives changing before your eyes? Or are they just coming in and being members? Are they coming in, just sitting in and enjoying you talk for an hour and you being a, 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 a motivational speaker? Are you saying all the good things that tickle people's ears and makes them feel good about themselves? Or are you speaking with the conviction and the fire of the Holy Spirit to watch their hearts and minds forever be changed? Are you teaching them how to use the sword of the Spirit to defend themselves against the lies of the enemy and to destroy the works of the devil? I know I'm supposed to go into the scripture reading, but I have to lay down the foundation for this first. Let's go to Colossians chapter three. This is what God is sick of. And no, it's not Simba, you're kind of getting, no, 
I grew up in the church. I can talk about it. I hated the church because the church did me so wrong and did me dirty. I had church hurt like you wouldn't believe. But when I saw Christ and I looked into his eyes and I saw that fire and I saw that love and I saw that compassion, that passion, and I saw that desire. I fell in love with the church because of him, because he loved the church. You know, when you truly love somebody, you'll love what they love. Or you'll at least give it a shot. Who here knows what I'm talking about? Some of y'all should. Some of you women, you don't like sports. You don't like football. You don't like none of that stuff. But if your husband is sitting down and watching football, you'll watch it with him. Why? Because you love him. You may not understand what's going on. You may not understand the game, but at least you love him. It's kind of the same way. There are things that my wife wants to watch and do that I'm like, Lord, just take me now. But because I love her, I'll watch it with her. I'll I'll do it with her. You know what I mean? See, my love for the church is because of Christ. And because Christ loves the church so much, that's why I'm on fire for the church. This is why you having church hurt and all that other stuff, you need to just fall in love with Jesus. He'll heal all of that. You need to fall in love with Yeshua. And I'm talking really fall in love with him. Like, be obsessed having encounters with him. To see him face to face. To see his glory. And I'm telling you, he will take care of all that for you. Let me go to Colossians chapter 3. If you then were raised with Christ, this is Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. If you then were raised with Christ, desire those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on earth. For you are dead, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then you shall appear with him in glory. Therefore, put to death the parts of your earthly nature, sexual immorality, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. You also once walked in these when you lived in them. But now you must also put away all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, and filthy language out of your mouth. Do not lie one to another since you have put off the old nature with his deeds and have embraced the new nature, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him who created it, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, Barbarian, Scythian, slave nor three, but Christ is all and in all. So embrace as the elect of God, holy and beloved, a spirit of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering. Bear with one another and forgive one another. If anyone has a quarrel against anyone, even as Christ forgave you, So you must do. And above all these things, embrace love, which is the bond of perfection. Do you see that? What did Christ say before he left? It was in John 15. He said, I want you to abide in my love. So that's Colossians 3, 1 through 14. I just read. He said, I want you to abide in my love. I want you to dwell in my love. Did you know that love, part of his love is the fire? Why? Because when you feel that warmth, that embrace, who here knows what I'm talking about? Those who have experienced the love of a mother, 
the love of a father, the love of a sister, the love of a brother, the love of a spouse, you know that there's just a warmth, there's a comfort that comes from them. I feel sorry for the Muslims because the Muslims um, in one of their hadiths, Muhammad actually encounters Allah. And when Allah touches him, Allah's hands are very cold. Let me tell you something. Coldness in the spirit realm is not a good sign. Coldness in the spirit realm indicates what is cold. Cold is the opposite of heat. See, when the Lord touches me, I feel warmth and I feel fire and I feel love, right? But when Allah touched Muhammad, he said, wow, your hands are cold. You know what that means? That means that Allah is a demon and that he has no love for Muhammad or any of the followers. There is no love there. Because if you touch him, he touches you and it's cold. In the spirit realm, coldness is equivalent to hate and anger. What? Simba, you're making that up. No, I'm not. Because I've stood before demons. And I felt when they come into the room. And it becomes very cold. And they let you know right off the bat that there is no love. There is it's pure hatred. It's literally, you know how um, when somebody murders somebody, what do they say? They say, and especially if they have no remorse and they're unemotional, they don't care. They call them what? Cold-blooded, right? See, y'all need to recognize these terms. They, they say what? That, that person is cold-blooded, right? That's literally what that means. It means the same thing in the spirit. But yet with God, the true God, there's fire. There's warmth. There's comfort. But I love what the scripture says in Colossians. It says, if you then raised with Christ, who here is raised with Christ? The Bible says that if you gave your life to Christ, you, the old you was on the cross with him. It died. And you are raised again, new life. I tell you the truth. If you look at me now to what I was before, this is a whole new Simba. I got whole new life. You understand this here? It's the same thing. But look then, it says, if you then were raised with Christ, desire those things. I love how it says not just want, it says desire. Desire those things. Look at that. Desire those things which are above where Christ sits at the right hand of God. It's even telling you specifically what to go for. It's telling you to go for where Christ is, where he dwells. For you know what the scripture says, where your heart is, there your treasure will be. Do you understand this? If my heart is with the Lord, that's where my treasure is. If my heart is where he is, if I'm engaging my thoughts and my heart with throne room realities, meaning, what does that mean? That means recognizing that, hey, when I read in the scriptures, even Exodus 24, what we just practiced earlier, I have access to the sapphire floor. I have access to the heavenly realms. I have access to the things of heaven. I have access through Yeshua, through the blood. I can experience heaven. Not when I die, I can experience it now because I'm with him and he's with me. My life is in him. His life is in me. 
Do you see that? And I love what it says, set your affection on things above, not on things on earth. For you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ and God. That's beautiful if you really understand it. My life is hidden. That's what baptism literally means. The baptism literally means basically take a dollar in the envelope. If you take a dollar in the envelope and you put the dollar in the envelope, you no longer see the dollar. What do you see? You see the envelope. The dollar has been baptized. Oh, I hope you understand that. Wow. The dollar was baptized. The You don't see the dollar anymore, even though the dollar is there. You see the envelope because the dollar has been baptized. But yet, look at what John the Baptist says. He said, there is one who will come who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and fire. That means you ain't even supposed to see this anymore. You're supposed to see the Holy Spirit and fire through me. But this is the problem. Many believers don't take that and understand that. Because the Holy Fire means what? Put to death. What? Sexual immorality uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil desire, covetousness. Mm -hmm. And it's hard to put away anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language, and lying. Lying is a very bad habit. But again, you're not understanding. God is just saying put it to death. Meaning, let it get burned in the fire. That's all he means. It's not like, okay, I got to do this myself. No, you just have to let God move in your heart and in your life and say, Lord, I don't want this anymore. I want you above all else. Touch me with your holy fire and then let him do away with it. I once saw someone who was struggling with homosexuality. They said, I prayed God um, to remove the gay away. Like you'll hear a lot of homosexuals say that. I prayed for God to remove the gay away and he didn't remove um, the gay away. Why didn't he remove the gay away? You know what? That's a good question. But now here's the better question. You wanted him to remove the gay away. Okay. How about you say, Lord, I give you my life. I give you my soul. You are my Lord and Savior. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your love. Let me love the things that you love. Help me to hate the things that you hate. Touch me with your holy fire because, Lord, I love you more than my own desires and myself. How about you try that and then you give me a call and see what happens? Because we have many testimonies. I know many brothers and sisters who struggled with homosexual desires and perverse and all those things. And guess what? They're saved and they're on fire for God now. Why? Because they handed everything over to him and they let God do the rest. You understand this here? Here, I'll prove it to you. Let's go to Isaiah chapter six, verse one. Watch this. I'll show you. It's God who will do the work. You ain't got to do nothing. You just got to make yourself available. And say, Lord, hit me. That's it. Watch this. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. 
Each one has six wings. With two, he covered his face. And with two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. One cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pulse of the door moved at the voice of him who cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Smoke from what? The fire. Moving on. And I said, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar in his hand, and he laid it on my mouth and said, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Now, where do you see Isaiah is the one who cleaned himself before God cleans him and does what he's supposed to do and calls him into ministry and calls him into his destiny? Where do you see that? You do not. In fact, you see Isaiah saying, I am a man of unclean lips. I'm not even fit to be here. I am a sinner. I am wrong. I am undone. That, that undone means like he was like in tears. He was like, I cannot believe this. I'm not fit. I'm not worthy to do anything. And he was a prophet. But when he saw the Lord, he said, I'm not even fit. But look at what happens when the angel brings from off the altar and touches him with just the fire because the coal is in the fire. He just touches him with the fire. Look at what happens and look at what happens to Isaiah. Look at this. I want y'all to see this. Then one of the seraphim flew to me with a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar in his hand, and he laid it on my mouth and said, This has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then I said, here am I, send me. He said, go and tell this people, keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and turn and be healed. Then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste without inhabitants and the houses without man and the land is utterly desolate and the Lord has removed men far away and there is a great forsaking in the midst of the land, but yet in it shall be a tent and it shall return and shall be burned as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down. So the holy seed is its stump. Do you see that? How in the world does Isaiah go from, oh Lord, I am so undone. I am so unworthy. I am so unclean. I'm a wretched, dirty sinner. To as soon as he's touched by the holy fire. And the Lord said, who will go for us? And he immediately goes from, I'm undone to send me, I'll go. Send me, Lord, I'll do it. That's a complete turnaround right there. Only those who have been in the fire can understand that. So there he is. He says, send me, I'll go. And then what does the Lord say? Go. He gives him the permission. He chooses him right there. He says, go. But I love what Isaiah says. He says, how long? 
shall I do this? And basically, God says, until the end, son. <laughs> That's basically what he said. Until the end. Until the end. Go. And Isaiah did it. Do you see how beautiful that is? I'm going to show y'all one more thing. And then I'm just going to let this go. Look at this. We're going to go to Matthew 3. I want you to start at verse 7. Okay. Are you learning something? Because this is what the holy fire will do. It will quicken you. It will strengthen you. It will have you speak with a boldness that you didn't even know that you possessed. And truthfully, you don't even possess it. It's the Lord who gives it to you. The holy fire will change everything in your life. And it will destroy the works of the devil. In fact, I'll show you that real quick. Um, after I show you this. Let's go to Matthew 3. Look at this. Verse 7. Look at what it says. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees, this is John the Baptist, come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who has warned you to escape from the wrath to come, therefore bear fruit worthy of repentance, and do not think to say within yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is put to the tree roots. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Do you see that? Now, pay attention. I indeed baptize you with water to repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. His fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean his floor and gather his wheat into the granary. But he will burn up the shaft with unquenchable fire. Do you see that? When this fire is ignited, it is relentless. And it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop because we're still in our sinful nature. And so what we have to do, we have to continually ask God to put us in the fire. I ask God for the fire every day. I ask him, Lord, keep me in your fire, my body, my soul, and my spirit. Because those are the three components that make up me. And then my soul is my mind, my will, and my emotions. I say envelop that in your fire. I tell you the truth, the change in my attitude, the change in my heart has been nothing but the Lord. And it honestly, it, it makes me um, tear up because I'm so thankful that God is still not done with me. <laughs> you, you understand? Like, I don't know who's getting this. But I'm glad I'm constantly changing. I'm constantly getting better. I'm constantly getting closer and closer to him. I'm constantly learning how to be a better friend and mentor. I'm learning how to be a better husband. I'm learning how to be a better friend of God. Because that's my desire. My desire is to be a true friend of God like Abraham was. Let me show you. Are you, who here is getting this? Am I just talking to the wall here? I hope you guys are understanding this. Because 
this is this is what makes this very important. I want you guys to just thank the Lord right now. And I want you just to thank him for the fire. I'm going to show you all something. We're going to go to Ezekiel 28 and I'm going to go verse 11. Look at what this does. Watch this. Uh, Ezekiel 28 verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me. That's Yeshua, okay? Anytime you see this in the Old Testament, that's Yeshua, okay? Moving on. Came to me saying, son of man, take up a limitation over the king of Tyre and say to him, thus says the Lord God. You had the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz, and the diamond, the beryl, the onyx, and the jasper, the sapphire, the emerald, and the carbuncle and gold. The workmanship of your settings and socket was in you. On the day that you were created, they were prepared. You were the anointed cherub that cover, that covers, and I set you there. You were upon the holy mountain of God. You walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. You were perfect in your ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. But the multitude of your merchandise, you were filled with violence in your midst and you sinned. Therefore, I have cast you as profane out of the mountain of God. And I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Do you see that? It says, I have destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Meaning, God is saying, I destroyed you by the fire. The very fire that you used to walk up and down, now that fire is going to be used to destroy you. Now look at this. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You have corrupted your wisdom by reason of your brightness. I cast you to the ground. I lay you before kings that they may see you. You have defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trade. Therefore, I have brought what? Fire out from your midst. It has devoured you. And I have turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all those who see you. What that means is as soon as you see the devil do something in your life or do something that, you ain't, that he ain't supposed to be doing, that you're like, you have no right doing that, send the fire on him. Send the fire on him. Why? Because what does the fire do? It says it right there. I have brought fire out from your midst. It has devoured you. That same holy fire that he used to go up and down and that he used to be a part of, it now destroys him. And it destroys his work. That's what Christ was showing. And so I pray that now, even more now than ever, remember, you cannot use the fire if you're not on fire, if you're not in the fire, if you're not pursuing the fire, if your mind, body, and spirit, your, your soul is not ignited by the fire, how in the world are you going to use it? If you don't have the passion for the ways of God, if you don't love God, if you don't love his people, if you don't love his ways, if you don't love his word, if you don't love the holiness of God, you cannot use the holy fire to destroy the works of the devil. And that's why the church, 
A lot of you churches are getting beaten up, smacked up by the devil left and right because you can't use the fire against him. But if you know how to use the fire, if you live from the fire, if you speak from the fire, if you love from the fire, you dwell and live in the fire, then when it comes time to use the fire, to use the word, then you can destroy the works of the devil. You can set people free free and God will be glorified in you, through you, and around you. I'm done.